Hello everyone. My name is Hubert Sablonnier. I'm a developer uh, working on web technologies for open device. And today I want to talk about JWT. The story begins with my first computer. So we got it for Christmas 1994. Okay, it wasn't my computer. It was the computer of the whole family. When my fa it was a compact Presario, 33 megahertz processor, state of the art. When my father brought it at home with my sister, we were like, this is crazy. We immediately, immediately looked for games. And for sure, we found games. But then our cousins clued us in about MS-DOS games. Whoa. Each time I was, you know, I was at my friend's house and he showed me a new game. I was like, does it flip? Does it fit on a floppy? Yeah. It's 2016 and Amazon web page doesn't really fit on three or four of them. So another talk for another time. One of my favorite games was The Lemmings. Have you ever played The Lemmings? Ah, now we're talking. I mean, I have this friend, he, he saw me recently, he was like, your pixelated Beatles t-shirt again? He doesn't really know the game. Is there, is there any Americans in the room? Yeah? OK, so let's cheer you up a bit <laughs> by. OK, so first, must mention, I played this game everywhere on every console, but I never played here, so. Yeah. Ah. Okay. So. This game is pretty simple. You have, you have small, I'll cut the sound because it's a bit curtsy. Okay, so <clears throat> it's fairly simple. You have little guys that fell off a hatch in the world and you have to save them to, to, uh, by showing them the exit. So let's, yeah, okay. And they are pretty dumb, so they only walk straight. So you must tell them to dig, to climb, to build some stairs, etc., just like in real life. And let me do fast, fast, fast forward. OK. So once you get them by the exit and you save them, you yeah, well, you have congrats, uh, but you also have a code. And what's pretty great about that code is that <clears throat> it's pretty handy. Let me explain. When you play that and you're at the 17 level and you hear, Hubert, it's dinner time. <coughs> well, that, com com that code comes pretty handy because, I mean, at that time you had to shut off the computer. So this code here, you just had to enter it on this screen and you could resume where you were before. Okay. Meanwhile, at Netscape headquarters, <coughs> Lou Montuli invents the blink tag. Yeah. <laughs> Don't laugh too loud. I used it, you used it, everybody used it. And Lou also has very good ideas. It's still, we are still in 1994, and Netscape is working for a client to develop a virtual basket for e commerce website. And back then, in order to, to do this, to store a state, you only had the URL. So it pretty much makes the buying experience like a vending machine, you know, one, one item at a time. So Lou proposed to apply the existing magic cookies concept on the web, and that's how HTTP cookies were born. So <clears throat> he worked with uh, John Gianandrea, and the support arrived pretty quickly in uh, Netscape. The first official usage was to know if a visitor on Netscape.com has already come to the website. So the, be the behavior hasn't changed much. But just, just so we are all on the same page, let's do a recap. 
So when a user sign in into a website on his browser, he enters his user password and he validates the sign in form. So the browser sends a post request to the server. The server asks the database if the user exists. And the database is like, OK, John Lennon, of course I know him. Here's the hashed and salted password. Then on the server, you have to do your, you know, your latest security protocol to, to check the password. So bcrypt, uh, scrypt, pbkdf2, whatever. If everything is OK, the server can finally send the response. And that's when the browser store the key value pair name equals John, the very cookie we're talking about. OK. And that's exactly where the browser is like, I'm a browser, so what do I do? I give the cookie back. So when the user navigates on the website, the cookie are sent to the server automatically, the cookie corresponding to this website. So then the server can look at the request and say, OK, this is John Lennon. Let's send him a dedicated page. But back then, as an eight-year-old child, I acted as the browser. I handled the state myself. I had my homemade framework, the notebook. And the thing with lemmings is that we couldn't guess the password for the next level. It, <laughs> that would be too easy. But in this case, I can easily trick the server to say, well, I'm Paul, but actually I was John. Yeah, I think it's that. Okay. The server must find a way to trust that what I give it to him. We need to find a re, um, um, some something for the server to trust the browser, and that's that's a reason, not the only one, uh, because <clears throat> that's one of the reason we invented session identifiers. So basically, if I take my example back. Once the server is about to respond, it just say, OK, so I got this from the database about John, about everything I know on him. And I'm going to generate a random ID, so maybe A42. And I'm going to use a third-party storing service, the memory, a database, it depends. And I'm going to say, OK, A42 is everything I know, the session of John. And then I can answer the server, the browser. And I just have to send in the cookies this random ID. And then I'm a browser. What do I do? I send the cookies. So once you navigate, you just send A42. And then the server, again, will need um, a third-party service, the same memory we used, to transform this obscure ID it, into information it really understands. So by doing a round trip to the memory, it can know that it was John, actually. So there are several, several problems to using session IDs. <clears throat> let's, yeah. let's do a quick pause, maybe. I need to drink. Something is wrong. Yeah, let's do this after, sorry. OK, so there are several problems with session IDs. If your site is successful, you're like, OK, maybe it will fail. I don't know. So one server couldn't be enough. No problem. You're like, OK, let's put a load balancer and two servers, and voila. OK, thank you, bye-bye. But Let's imagine you're very, very, very successful. Okay. On this uh, diagram, every node of the cluster is the same instance. Whether you used provisioning VMs, containers, interns that do it by hand, as you want, 
This is the same configuration. So each server has its own memory. And with the load balancer, if I arrive with the session A42, well, I could end up on the correct node that knows about session A42, but I could end up on a server that doesn't know anything about it. <clears throat> so the easy and naive solution for this is to no longer have any memory cache and maybe try a shared cache. Yeah. So the shared cache could know about A42, but it would also know about D71, for example. And everyone could ask the shared cache. And that's when, what, what did we just do? It's going to work somewhat. Yeah. What did we, did we just do? We ask all the requests to go the same way in a very simple matter. And actually, the result is not that good. <laughs> and if I do fast forward, it's going to get ugly. OK. <clears throat> Sorry. No. It's going to work someday. OK. So the problem is we just created a single point of failure. And if the server, the, this magical shared cache fa falls, we are basically screwed. So. Let's find another solution. Maybe we could let each memory on each server and put a distributed cache. I mean, we all use them, we all heard of them, memcached, ehcache, etc. So we set it up, and whatever the node, the load balancer chooses, every node knows about every session, so it's OK. And if a session fails, uh, a node fails, some users may be disconnected, but the site isn't down. So it's, it's not that of a problem. I, I mean, it's better than what we had before. There's <clears throat> I, I've worked with many clients, and at some clients, this was, it works on my machine. I go to the ops team, and I'm like, EHCache, memcache, what can we do? And they're like, no problem, man, tomorrow it's fixed. And I saw other companies where it was like, oh my god, we need all the, the nodes of the cluster to see each other. It's going to be chatty all the, all the place. We have to open ports, blah, blah, blah. And three, three long meetings, three um, weeks after that, it's still not that there. So it will really depend on your context. But sometimes this technique is a bit uh, complicated to handle. The other solution would be to, to put some intelligence in the load balancer. So with something that's called sticky sessions. So when a request arrives, like D71, the load balancer knows exactly where to send the, the request. And if it's A42, A42. If that node falls, well, here we, we have a bit of a problem. And that's where all solutions are not really silver bullets. So beyond that, nothing prevents you, and it depends if you have the budget or not, to put a load balancer with sticky session and distributed cache, a bit like uh, having a seat belt and, uh, and an airbag. So again, you're many in the room. Each one has a different context, a different team, skills, ops, devs, different budget too. Uh, so it will really depend on what you can implement. But I, I cannot help myself from thinking about the fact that if we were to manage the state on the client side, maybe it could be a bit simpler. And that's where the IETF, the Inge Internet Engineering Task Force, gives us RRC 7, 7519. 
Who read an RFC recently? Oh. Nice. So let me simplify uh, this RFC for you. So basically, it talks about JSON Web Token. The first thing you need to know, it has nothing to do with Google Web Toolkit. OK? OK. It has nothing to do with the Tennis Man 2. It's about tokens and the web. And if you're like, oh, what is, the, what is this, this uh, JWT? You'll, you'll go to Google. So you'll find some articles, you know, those articles, a bit like People magazines or Diet Suggestions magazine, you know? Like, cookies, JWT, which one should I choose? And you're like, hmm, this is interesting, I'm reading it. You should not. You should not. It's a very, I, I'm picky, and there's someone in the room who has to. It's very different. You cannot compare those stuff. It's what you can compare is JWT and session IDs. And you're like, but session IDs and cookie are the same. They are not. And don't say that to me if you're too close to me, please. So we can compare session IDs and, talk and JWT because basically a JWT is a token, just like a session ID. And there's two kinds of tokens. So token by reference and token by value. So I like this comparison of you to, to use is saying that a token by reference is like a credit card. So if I take the credit card from Antonio there, I won't know if he's rich or poor. I mean, I need a third party storing service, his bank, to know about it. Um, but if it gives me a 500 euro bill, I'm like, this guy is rich. Or maybe he was and now I am. But the difference is with a banknote, the only thing I need to do is to check that he, he didn't print it at home on his Canon, you know? I need to check that it was from the European Central Bank. And that, that's exactly how JWT works. So let's take the example again. So we did our run trip to the database, we checked the password, and before we had, we, we needed a third party service. Now we don't. We only need to write and sign information. So first we write, okay, this is John Lennon, he plays the guitar, blah, blah, blah. And then just like the Central Bank of Europe, you stamp the thing, you sign it. It's, a, it's an official document. And then you can send it to the cookies. Oh, OK. I can use JWT with cookies. So all of those articles were not that great, to say it friendly. Yeah, you can. So what does a browser do when he has cookies? I'm a cookie. What do I do? I send. Um, <laughs> I'm a browser, what do I do? I send the cookies. So every time you navigate, the, the token is sent back. And then the only thing you need to do is verify first. So you check the dollar bill is OK, or euro. Um, and then you read the information. OK, I read the information. It's John. Let's say, welcome, John. OK. So, what does it look like, JWT? So, it looks like that. The Sherlock Holmes in the room should see some clues that there is something looking like JSON, yeah? Curly braces quote in Base64, come on. Okay. <coughs> There's actually three parts in a JWT. They are separated by dots. The first part is the encoded header. The second part is the encoded payload. And the third part is the signature. OK. 
So if any of you in the room says to someone after leaving from there, oh, JWT are encrypted, the Red Hat guy told me, no. <laughs> I said encoded, okay? This is completely different. It's encoded in base64 URL. So it's just like base64 with a few differences to be URL safe. <clears throat> and actually, if I use a base64 decode function and I, and I look at it, hmm, it looks like JSON. So it's a string, basically. So now I need to decode it, to parse it. OK, now we're talking. So let's look at the payload in, in the details. So the, um, the specification tells us a lot of stuff about the kind of information we can put in the payload. They are called claims. So this token is claiming information. And I will use the signature to verify if it's true or false. And there's a series of public claims that are uh, yeah, public claim that are reserved and specified, and then you can put whatever you want, allowing uh, depending on the size you you will try to focus on. So the first is the issuer. So this is where you're gonna identify who printed the banknote, you know, who signed the token. So here it's my authentication backend. It's a string. You can put the, it really depends on your context, but you can put whatever you want. It really depends on your business. The second is the, the subject. So you can put um, a login, an email. Again, depending on your context, it must be a string. The second, the third is the audience. So if you're going to do single sign-on, you will maybe target the, the token to a specific audience, you know? Um, then you have the expiration time. This is one of the, the most important. And at first I was like, so there's a payload and he's giving me the information of when he won't be um, relevant anymore. It's a bit strange, no? It's like, hey, I'm saying this, and I am the one telling you until when I'm going to be true. But again, because it is signed, I can't trust that. So you have the date of when you shouldn't trust the token anymore. You also have the opposite. It can be useful if you're providing a paid API. You can deliver a token that will only work uh, at that period of time with the not before. Then you have the issued out, sometimes useful. And last, the JWT ID. We'll go back on this one after, but it must be an identifier really completely unique to all the tokens you generated. So forget about auto increment, and a UUID should be OK. Then you can have some private claims. And here I put it a name I want to use in my system and a few permissions. OK. So how does the server trust this thing? Well, if you remember, I had three parts. And in the first one, in the header, I have an algorithm. So bear with my French, OK? Here, the algorithm is HMAC256, uh, sorry. So what I need to do is to, as a server, to trust this information, is to use this algorithm and apply a function, so HMAC256, on the encoded header, a dot, and the encoded payload. So it's the first part of the token, actually. And this hashing function needs a secret. So don't use this one, obviously. Um, and so you're like the browser or any kind of client, mobile app, sends me this, uh, this uh, payload. But how can I really trust it? Actually, if I were to play on my browser, 
and maybe mess up with the Yoko Hono or something, I could say, my name is Paul McCartney. And, well, it does the same actually, but he also plays the bass. Bass, like that, yeah? Okay, so as you can see, as I type, you can't see it. Yeah, you can. Okay. Oh yeah, it has to be. Yeah, sorry. Correct, um, Jason. So the the signature change, obviously. So if I were to mess up with the payload, then I would have to maybe guess what is the secret on the server side and try a few stuff like this. And I mean, at some point, it's worse than mining bitcoins because if you really wanted to fake the signature, it should be cryptographically impossible. So normally at that moment, you're like, this is great. I need to use this. Yes, of course, there are some benefits but we'll come to the drawbacks after. So the first benefit is we have that simple load balancing. <laughs> of course, if I take my example again, I don't need any distributed cache, any shared cache, anything. I just need some <coughs> CPU, and I'm saying that, but it's really simple, to calculate a base64, an HMAC something, a parsing JSON, and that's all. I'm completely stateless. And because it is a, a specification, a standard, it works with any kind of platform and any kind of language. So you'll be able really to, to have your, your architecture with main, maybe several language using the same tokens. And since we talk about architecture, if you love microservice or, or just service-oriented architecture, it works really well. So if I take my good old monolith um, and I try to, to split the logic that is in it, so maybe I extract the full text search, the basket handling, something, etc. I'm splitting my monolith. I have microservices. Yeah, I can put that on LinkedIn. I'm really happy. but. Have you ever talked about microservices with someone and it was like, oh, I have all this, uh, it's a French guy, I have all these microservices and I, uh, I plug them to, uh, to MongoDB, it's okay, no? No, it's not. I mean, at some point, if you can remove, if you can remove the state, it would be better. So let's try to avoid the single point of failure. So I've been telling you about the secret, you know, and it's shared around the, the architecture. But as anyone knows, when you share a secret, it's not a secret anymore. So what's interesting is that you have two kinds, two ways to sign a token. The first we saw is a symmetric signature with a shared secret. But you can also do asymmetric signatures with a private key and a public key. I didn't say it was encrypted, okay? okay. This is just signing. So remember the header, you could provide a different algor algorithm working with the private keys and public keys. And if I take my example back here, as I said, I have a shared secret everywhere, so this is bad. But if I say I'm using so uh, public keys everywhere and maybe only a private key on the, the component of my architecture that handles the security, huh, now we're talking, it could be better. Maybe you could use Keycloak. There's a good talk from Sebastian from Monday on this, if you want to know more. Um, but that's the basics, okay? So what about OAuth2? It's a completely different topic, or at least it's a topic that deserves its own talk. So 
What you need to remember regarding JWT is that OAuth2 tokens are mostly obscure, opaque. But there's no reason we couldn't use JWT. It's a bit longer, maybe, but it removes the fact that we would need a storing service to verify stuff. And we can actually check the access token and the refresh token in a completely sta stateless way. But remember, uh, the purpose of a refresh token would be uh, to go to a database to verify that John hasn't been uh, dead, sorry. Okay, so it's the same with OpenID. Uh, it's a topic that deserves its own talk, but it's not like in the magazine, OpenID, uh, um, JWT, which one should I choose? If you use JW, uh, OpenID Connect, the ID token is actually a JWT. So specs, specifications are getting together to share what's really important in all of them. So now we can leave the unicorn world and talk about the drawbacks. The first drawback and the most important one is tokens revocation. So what do you do if you have to revoke a token, but you don't want to revoke all of them? I mean, at some point, I would like to fix the typo on my slide without changing all in my slides, you know? And the problem is, if you have your architecture, how can you, in a stateless way, refuse someone and not someone else? Think about the banknotes. Think about the passports. The only way is to have a list of people that can't take the plane, for example. So a blacklist. And that's where you use the, the JWT ID in the payload. It's an identifier for this token. So maybe you could use a blacklist to, to have all the tokens that are not supposed to pass. Hmm. This is nice, interesting, but in security, we always prefer to say no one can pass and I have a list of people that can enter. If you do a blacklist and if for any reason that blacklist fails, you're letting everyone enter. And you could be like, well, but um, I won't have to store all those IDs. I, won't, I will only have to store the revoked IDs. Yeah. So it's easier to, to handle. But again, it's as a security, um, it's, it's a bit uh, problematic. So again, uh, on drawbacks, uh, the security on single page application. It's not that much of a drawback, but you have to be careful. And there's a lot of articles that are like, OK, JWT cookies, you remember? Uh, they are not secured at all. It's mostly wrong to simplify that that way. JWT are not more secured or less secured than identi um, session identifiers. But once you use cookies, or if you use what some article um, says, like using local storage to store this JWT, you can be subject to cross-site scripting attacks. So cross-site cross scripting attacks, remember, you have maybe a user content that can be injected. If they are injected in your page, they can read the local storage and they can read some of the cookies. Okay, you have this third party scripts who has ever read the code of Google Analytics of any script that is from elsewhere. I mean, you don't know what's in it and it can read anything and send it somewhere else. And obviously you also have the problem of non-secured HTTP over public Wi-Fi. But 
we are all adults here, so we are using HTTPS. Um, so what about cookies? Actually, you don't use local storage, you use cookies. But you use them with the HTTP only flag. And you also use the secure flag. So the HTTP only flag prevents any JavaScript executed on your page, even yours, to do document.cookies and to read them. So actually, it's a bit like uh, I'm a server, I'm giving you these cookies, and the browser is like, OK, I'm keeping the cookies. I won't give them to the page. But every time I talk with the server, I will give him the cookies. And the secure flag is if any of your users writes uh, mysite.com instead of HTTPS mysite.com, the cookies won't leave. If you're using JWT with a, not with the browser, but with mobile apps, third-party server between third-party servers, you could even use uh, transmit them with the authorization header. Sometimes some libraries are easier to, to use with that than parsing cookies. So once we use cookies, I'm a browser, what do I do? OK, I, I send the cookies. And you are subject to CSRF attack also known as XSRF attack. Let's say CSRF, like the like uh, someone, I don't know, but I've heard it's called like this. So CSRF attacks. Imagine you build this malicious website, and you try to build a form and to get people on your site, and so they click on it. It's very simple. If you want people to click on that, you put earn your life and your and your stuff without doing anything, people will click on it. And if I do that, I'm on malicious.com, and I'm doing a request to Twitter. So what does the browser do? He sends the cookies to Twitter. So obviously, it doesn't work with Twitter. So how do they do? Actually, on their page, when um, you load the page, the form to tweet contains a hidden uh, input. And so they call that the authenticity token. It's also known as the synchronizer token pattern. So if you use a Symfony on PHP, Django on Python, uh, any Java framework, uh, all of them support that kind of CSRF token pattern. So how does it work? The browser sends the cookies, as always. Um, Twitter is like, OK. This is session, session A42. Um, I know this guy, and I will send him an, a random ID I put in his session. And once he talks with, every time he talks with me and he tries to send, uh, to post a tweet, he has to send the cookies automatically. But in the form, there should be the, the famous token. So Twitter can go, round trip to the memory, get the information about the user, and compare what's in the session with the authenticity ID 36. If, it's, if it works, you can send the, you can create the, the tweet. If I were on malicious website, I wouldn't be able to forge and to send the authenticity ID 36, because I have no way to get it. And so here we have a session, but can we do that with JWT? Of course we can. So it's only at that time that you can use local storage. Only at that time that you can use local storage. So imagine you have your website, you, you are logging in, OK? At that time, what you do is write and sign a JWT, as always, John Lennon, blah, 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 permission. And you add in the payload a random ID, just like the ID from Twitter. But instead of putting it in the session, you put it in the payload. OK. Then you send the cookie, as always, and you add a header in the response. So here I say, my CSRF token is 36. OK. 
and at that time your your web app can do i mean uh, angular react uh, any framework you have to put it in the local storage and you put some um, interceptor on uh, ajax request and on each request you get the 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 id and you send it in the request so that way you completely isolated from the two kind of attacks because as a ja as a javascript in your page whether it's yours or something injected you have access to the local storage 36 but you don't have access to the cookies okay and that's why it's it works actually and on the server the thing you have to do is to verify the jwt at first and then compare the the csrf id that was sent with the payload that was sent by the browser itself that diagram is like oh my god okay you have to play with it to for it to make sense it's been already uh, a lot of time it's frozen yeah so yeah don't hesitate to go back to that diagram then the tweet anything is created so there's many other JWT applications that you can think of. Actually, uh, we have a specification to sign information, so we could use it for anything else. Um, with On a project, we tried to remove the session we needed to do multi-part forms. Um, so the first part did a round trip to the server, and we stored it in the, in the JWT. We also tried to remove the, the token we use in confirmation emails. So what we do nowadays is that I lost my password. OK, I click. The server generates a random ID, put it in the row for John. So John, if he wants to reset his password, has to send a request with a, this kind of ID. And I send him an, a URL through the email. Actually, because JWT are URL safe, because of base64 URL, you can send them here. The problem is maybe to put a very short expiration. Then I want to, to close with a, an ID. We saw uh, the drawbacks, the benefits, and when I talk about this topic, I'm like, OK, so what do I do? Do I do a blacklist? Should I use it on the client, on the server? And there is a pattern I really like, is that if you have some kind of API gateway, uh, there's many of them, and you have a distributed architecture, microservice architecture, what's very interesting is to draw the limit and say, on the public part, on the web, I'm going to still use session ID. And on the private part, I'm going to use JWT. By doing that, on the public world, you still have something opaque. And in security, it's always better. And on the private part, you don't have the MongoDB dependence. You, know? you don't have all your system that requires a third party to know if a request is valid. And actually, the API gateway has act as a transformer. It's like, oh, your session 42, I'm going to need at some, uh, at some moment a storage um, mechanism, memory, database. But I will only need it at that place. And that's where I do my whitelist of people authenticated. And then I can write a JWT that contains the information needed for the rest of the handling of the request, and I can pass it. So my server can be, OK, I have a request to delete something from this application. In the JWT, I check the permission. And because I have the public key, I can verify that this guy has the permission. And really, you isolate the, the private key maybe on the API gateway or at some other place. 
And then you have really reference on one side and by value on another, th another side. So I hope you have a better understanding of how to, to think about this, how JWT works. Most of the time, I would say that you will be in a better shape with stateless architecture. It's the best way to save lemmings, after all. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Yeah? Do you think there is some kind of limitation how much information I should store in the DMW? So your question is about the size of the token? OK, so the problem is, because you have the signature and a payload in JSON, it's very m more, it's more um, big, it's bigger, sorry, than a, a simple ID. So that's where you do what you did maybe with your session, is like having the smallest session possible to simplify stuff. But yes, it creates a constraint because you have to limit it at some point. So I tried to do maybe for the permissions to do a dictionary to reduce the you know the length of the payload it's it actually doesn't really help and it opens security holes so if you were used to put a lot of stuff in your session it can be a problem there's limits that are different on many browsers and also on nginx apache etc Yes? How often should I rotate my private key? How often should I? Rotate my private key. It's, so the question is, how often should I um, rotate my private keys? The, it's a very good question. I know that in the... Um, so it's not a question I'm, I'm really able to answer. But just so you know, in the header, you can put an identifier for the key that was used. So the, I think a product of Ashicorp does that, handling private keys like that. And that way, you can rotate them and use the, the, the ID of the key in the header of the JWT to know which one to use. I would say rotate them. Uh, with a, an overlap on their life, lifetime. But uh, it will really depend if you're doing a website for your grandma bridge or if you're doing a bank. Uh, it depends. <laughs> Sorry. Is there any more question? Yeah, sorry. Mm. So the the question is, when I do, uh, whoa, sorry, when I do this, oh my god, I, I can't find it. It's gonna be okay. So the question is, when I do the verification and I had voluntarily something in the payload, I, could I use the, the identifier of the token? I never thought about that, so I'm not going to answer right now. But my first thought would be, maybe you don't want to couple them, and you would, need, you would want uh, the token identifier to really be random and meaningless for the business and just useful for revocations. Apart from that, uh, my guess is as good as yours. We would have to maybe to do some research. Yeah. Yeah? Um, because you mentioned that you want to revoke um, some, uh, some token. Uh, you suggested that you do it by having a list of IDs that are blacklisted or whitelisted. It doesn't matter. But that would imply that I have to store all the Yeah. 
Yeah. So. So the question is, if I want to revoke John, I need to know wh what was the last ID in the last token I created for him for his, uh, yeah. The thing is, you could store that in your um, database for users. Um, I mean, this is not an information you will need all the time. So maybe having to do a round trip to know if this guy it has this idea or not to revoke him. You could do that at the time you create the token, but not at the time you check it, which is all the time, you know? And really do it at creation time, maybe. Again, I'm just trying to to understand your, your context, but I would say that, yes. Yes? Yeah, the thing, if you build a blacklist, you only have to, to store the token until they, their end of uh, validity, yes. Yes? Uh, when you talk about uh, cell dating, what? You have the session uh, expiry time as well. Is that, is oh, you mean the cookie expiry? Yeah. Does, yeah. The JSON web token has uh, expiration time as well. Yeah. Well, the idea is that if I put an expiration time in maybe tomorrow and the, uh, you, lose, uh, you, you have in your phone uh, an application that's open with a token that will work until tomorrow, your phone is stolen, you need to, to log in somewhere else and to destroy the ability for the, store, uh, the thief to use that. So you have no way to change the payload on the device, you know? Once it's been issued, if someone has it, it works until the expiration time. That's when you need a blacklist, and that's a solution that's not really, most of the time, really efficient or secured. It's not automatically? Okay. Uh, we can do that after maybe for the details. Yeah? Okay, so I didn't mention that. That So the question is, once I use, um, once I use uh, the HTTP only, uh, what is the name, HTTP only flag on the, on the uh, cookies, I cannot read the cookies anymore. And yeah, it's a drawback because one of the purpose of the JWT is to be able to read the information in the payload. So for that, we, we needed that once for our client. We, on, we just had to do a round trip, and a round trip that reads the information and that gives us the payload without having the signature and too much information. And if you have... Um, if you have a mobile app, you won't have this problem. And if you work between servers, you won't have this problem too. So yes, the only way to secure it on a browser is to use HTTP only cookies. And it removes you the ability to read the content, which is a bit uh, troubling, yes. It was not the question. I didn't understand. Okay. So how do you protect your own REST code? Code. You protect in cross-site scripting code, but you still want to have your code protected. You still have to have your code protected by these tokens. Okay. So you mean the the Twitter ID I presented? No, yeah. Are you talking about single sign-on? No, no, no. Okay, can we do this just after? Maybe it would be simpler to, to understand. Is there any more questions? Yeah?
So the question is, most of uh, on many websites when I log in, I'm logged for a very long time. How can we do that with JWT without being less secured? Is it your question? Yeah, oh yeah. So you want maybe to update it? Yeah, okay. So at first, we were a bit like you. So we asked our client, do you want the session to work like one hour after the last usage? Or do you want it to expire after a given moment of time after the login? Is it? Yeah. And hopefully they said one hour after the login and that's also one of the many problems of JWT is that if you want to update something in the payload like the expiration time but I also had to do that on one of my websites to update your nickname in the payload you have to issue another another token and actually the previous one is still valid so if you want to remove a permission from the from the token, it's a bit uh, of a problem, you know. That's why, uh, in the end, and again, it depends uh, on your context, but I think this kind of architecture really helps you on the server to only trust token by value and simplify a lot of stuff, but. To, ve to keep things very more secured on the front end, I think you should maybe keep uh, opaque session IDs. It's open to debate, yeah. So I'll be available uh, until Friday. Don't hesitate to, to catch me to, to ask uh, lots of questions. And uh, thank you very much.